Good, good afternoon, good afternoon. So some of you have been here with me uh, now for, for five. This is the sixth of the N150 Nebraska lectures. This year, I was just about to brag that I thought I finally had, a, had the microphone right, but you could see I kind of lost it there for a minute. Uh, this is our sixth now out of 12, and of course, we'll look forward to having with you uh, at each of these. We hope you'll bring some more of your friends as we move in through the, the year and celebrate the university's 150th anniversary. Uh, the goal of the Chancellor's Dis Distinguished Ch uh, Lecture Series is, is to really to bring a lot of people uh, together uh, in, to, to discuss important uh, topics, uh, to learn, in this case, in some cases, to learn about the history of the university or the, the, and, and how it informs what we're gonna do as we look into the future. Uh, and the, the presentations uh, give us a chance to highlight some of the very best of uh, the faculty and the staff uh, that we have involved with interdisciplinary research and with creative activity uh, here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. This lecture series is sponsored by the UNL Research Council uh, and it's in cooperation with the Office of the Chancellor and also, of course, my organization, the Office of Research and Economic Development. Uh, and, if, and as well, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, which we call OLLI. I know we've got some OLLI members here with us today. I always want to give you a big hand and thank you. So, and I also, my friend Chris Summerick is just back here in the, uh, with uh, Humanities Nebraska, the executive director. Chris has uh, helped, of course, his organization is, is also a big sponsor for this year's lectures. And as well, we've had uh, additional support from the National Endowment of the Humanities, which is supporting both our expanded series, so 12 instead of two lectures this year. And also with the grant, we're, we've been able to create podcasts of all of the presentations, and we have them both archived for, for historical purposes and also to make them available to audiences at large. I especially want to recognize the university's research council it includes uh, faculty from all ranges of, of disciplines across, the, across the, the, uh, the campus. And for these lectures, the council does the heavy lifting. Uh, they solicit proposals from our faculty and nominations. Uh, they make assessment and they, re they try to choose what they think will be the very best topics. Uh, and they, they, they use their familiarity with our faculty to make sure that we have the very best presenter, so no pressure here today, Eileen. <laughs> um, I also want to, uh, to welcome our listeners and our viewers who are uh, seeing this from live web stream on, web, on Facebook Live, so we're glad to have you with us here today. And I wanna just get, get moving here, but before I stop talking, let me just talk a little bit about the format. So we're gonna have the lecture, it's gonna be great. And then afterwards, Nathan Meyer, who is our Assistant Vice Chancellor for Research, Nathan's around here somewhere, I know, over here. Uh, he's going to join uh, Eileen again up at the stage and help to moderate a question and answer session. So there'll be plenty of time for some discussion, questions and answers after the presentation. And then at, finally at the end, my, my role here, my, my key role brought me here to Nebraska is I am the prize master. So we have uh, prizes, uh, well, at least a prize. We have a prize uh, for the audience uh, at the end. And we'll have one lucky winner. And dear old Nebraska. So be coming up, coming up at the end. Uh, we'll also have uh, some reception activity at the end. And did I hear right, Mike, is this, this is the time that we'll have uh, dairy, dairy store ice cream? There you go. So another prize. For all of you. Well, with that, um, I'll just say you, you want to stay around. You've got to be here to win. So stay for the end. And with that, I want to welcome Richard Moberly, uh, our Interim Executive Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, who will now introduce our speaker. Thanks, Bob. So it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you to today's Nebraska lecture featuring Eileen Bird a landscape architect and assistant director of landscape services. If you've attended our N150 lectures this year, you know that many of them have focused on the university and state history, 
And today, Eileen will describe how our campus landscape has transformed from initial plantings around University Hall to modern green spaces that sprawl nearly 700 acres. Whether you work at the university or simply enjoy visiting campus, the beauty of our green spaces is something we can all appreciate and admire. We're also fortunate to have a number of local gardening enthusiasts who've worked hard to make our gardens beautiful and ensure they serve as educational tools for anyone who visits campus. Placards show the Latin name plus the common name of a variety of plants. And whether you stop to admire the Husker red penstemon in June or the stark beauty of prairie grasses blanketed in snow, you'll find native species and thriving ecosystems during all four seasons. Eileen grew up on her family's farm near Schuyler, Nebraska. She earned her bachelor's degree from Nebraska, where a class in outdoor site planning helped inspire her future career. She worked for the engineering and design firm Clark Anderson Partners and earned a master's degree from Kansas State before getting smart and returning to the university in 1999 to lead landscape services. So please join me in welcoming Eileen, who will present Growing a Campus Landscapes at the University of Nebraska. Thank you. Thank you. It is an honor to be here um, to share with you these photos and stories about the campus gardens and how they've grown. Uh, many of the images are from the university archives. The university ar archives were a great resource for this presentation. I also um, used a notebook that we had at Landscape Services that documented the history of the gardens. Landscape Services is a department within Facilities Maintenance and Operations, which is a division of Business and Finance. Landscape Services is a department that plants and prunes the trees. We plant uh, shrubs, flowers, we mow the grass, and we also pick up litter on all 617 acres of the campus, both city and east campus. We also install and maintain the irrigation systems um, empty trash and recycling dumpsters. We plow and scoop the snow in the winter. So next winter when you're getting ready to go to work and you think about, you can think about landscape services employees and how they've already almost put in a full day of work with starting at two or three anymore, two or three in the morning so that they can clean the sidewalks and have it ready for you when you get to campus. My, my presentation will cover the early history of the landscapes, the influencers of the campus landscape, and then some significant trees. Um, this is Lincoln in 1869, when the University of Nebraska opened its doors to 20 college students and about 110 Latin school students. University Hall was located in the raw prairie. This is University Hall in 1873. Um, the population of Lincoln at that time was 8,000. Um, on March 17, 1886, Charles Bessie wrote a letter to the Board of Regents to request funds to plant uh, the Botanical Garden. He wanted to plant 50 to 100 species of plants this season in the flower beds around the main building, which was University Hall, and the vacant spaces in the lot assigned to trees and shrubs. He thought $150 would be significant for, or sufficient for him to use. He also requested temporary walks be installed around the chemical building. He said that temporary walks must be provided as the grounds are in a condition that after it rains, it is impossible to reach either entrance without wading through a great deal of mud. He requested 10 or $15 for a temporary walks. He also thought that the hedge surrounding the campus was compact enough to turn cattle away. Therefore, he, re he recommended that as much of the board fence be taken down. And if the board approved that, he already had some funds from the last appropriation the year before. So then in June 1886, he also wrote another letter to the Board of Regents to update them on the trees and shrubs that were planted that spring and fall. He said that the plants had done very well. A few plants perished during the fall and winter. 
The rabbits injured some of the small trees. Cattle and horses broke down several. Boys playing football upon the campus crushed down some. And two little trees were stolen. These losses, however, were not, didn't amount to more than a small percentage. And he probably thought that was about what he might have expected. We still have those issues today with rabbits, stolen trees, damage during football games, and some other items too that happen on campus. Around 1903, 15 years later, this photo was taken, and now we have a significant amount of trees on campus. Um, Old Main is just uh, off to the wide sidewalk area. Shrubs and ornamental plants had been planted at that time. A perimeter fence was installed around the campus in 1892. This fence was an attempt to beautify the campus along with paving the walks and adding more plants on campus. Um, this is one of the gates in the fence. And the fence was removed in 1922 for several reasons. One was because there was a fire in one of the buildings and the fire trucks couldn't get to the building. And there also was, the campus was expanding and so they didn't have enough fence to go around it. So they took, it, they took the fence down and it was installed at Wyuka Cemetery. And thinking back about it, I thought, okay, that fence is 127 years old. You don't think about that when you drive Y on O Street. A section of the fence was kept and the two and two gates were reinstalled by the columns, which is on North 12th Street. At the top of the gate is a casting of the university seal. It's right in this location. At some point, both of the seals were stolen. Um, and one was there for a long time. And then as um, um, Prices for scrap metal went up. We lost that one. And so we asked the University Art Department to make us new seals, and we put them back up on the gates. The columns were installed in 1930. This photo is from 1949, and vines were allowed to grow up the columns. These columns came from the Burlington Railroad Station in Omaha, which was designed by Thomas Kimball. The Burlington Station was to be remodeled in 1929, and the columns were surplused. George Seemeyer, who was a former regent, was, had an interest in campus planning, and he worked to get the columns transferred by train to Lincoln. The shaft of the main section of the columns is all one piece. Um, and it's all pink granite. Uh, most columns on buildings are in barrels and they stack together. And these were all one piece, which is very significant. These columns stand today on the terminus of 12th Street Mall. There are two rows of 12 columns for a total of 24 columns. There are four more columns that are not in this section that are over on the south side of the stadium in the uh, dedication area to the football coaches, Devaney and Osborne. They're the same columns as these. A few years back, Landscape Services was asked to remove the vines on the columns so that they could be inspected. After we had the vines off the columns, we, we noticed that they were much more visible. Um, I was walking with my brother one day um, going to a football game, and he graduated here from the university. We were walking down the 12th Street Mall, and he, he said to me, when did they put those up? So he didn't even know that they were there because they were covered with vines. This is the Seymour Plan. This is an early master plan of campus. The Seymour Plan was, for, it was made to expand the campus and was developed under the leadership of the president of the Board of Regents, which is George Seymour, in 1926. This plan generally brought us Memorial Mall, which is the mall that's by the stadium, 
It also brought us this green space um, by the libraries, which they called the quadrangle. And it also brought us Greek Row. Street closures and vistas were also a main component of this plan. And this plan was generally used for 25 years. Here's Memorial Mall. This, at this time, it was called John J. Pershing Parade Grounds. And it was located on axis with the, the football stadium. In 1931, a campus beautification plan was announced in the Nebraskan, and this old drill field, which had its walks and cinder plant paths cut across it, was to become a new central mall. And the mall was to be 50 feet wide, with two openings on 14th Street for an increased traffic. The 50-foot width was provided so that they could have additional parking on S and T streets. The area in the middle of the mall was to be graded to drain and it was um, to be planted with grass. This area remained turf until the late 1990s when Chancellor Meeser added parking to the mall to compensate for the loss of parking when the Kaufman Residential Center was built. It was to be a two-year temporary parking lot. And there was a sign that we put up on the parking lot sign that said temporary. It was pretty big. And at some point, that temporary sign came down. But the parking lot's still there. There are plans to make that green again. It's, we're in the phasing plan of that right now. Here's a view of Memorial Mall in the foreground. So you can see how it's turned into a turf area. And this is from about 1940s. Um, the buildings on this uh, picture are uh, Morrill Hall, which was built in 1927, which is this building. Um, to the left of that, this is Bessie. And then um, Love Library is at the background, which was um, built in 1941. And you can see the front. The front of the building was to the north originally with the columns on it. And there's also an unexpected view of the Nebraska State Capitol building, which was, built, which was finished in 1932. Mueller Tower wasn't built yet in this photo. Here's a photo from um, commencement that was held on that Memorial Mall from August of 1962. So some of the people that influenced the campus landscape. Charles Bessie. Dr. Charles Bessie, he came to the, uni to the university in 1884 and was the dean of the Industrial College. He built a strong botany department and contributed significantly to the Industrial College, which became the Ag Department. He studied Nebraska grasses and native and any plants that would grow in Nebraska. This is a graduation photo with Old Main in the background. Dr. Charles Bessie played a large part in developing the first arboretum on city campus. He was probably instrumental in planting many of these trees. He's standing in the middle of the photo right next to this tree right here. On East Campus in June of 1886, Bessie wanted to create an arboretum, and he and Ralph Emerson worked on the design. Emerson was a student of Bessie's and then became a horticulture professor. This was the plan for the Arboretum on East Campus on the corner of 33rd and Holdridge. So Holdridge Street's at the bottom and 33rd Street's over here on the right. So it is the site right now where Hardin Hall stands. Bessie, in a letter to the Board of Regents, requested to plant this Arboretum. He wanted 10 to 15 acres on the west side of the farm for planting of forest trees and that later we make plantation along the little stream that runs near the north boundary. The details of the plan were not yet worked out, but by the time of the next board meeting, a comprehensive plan and details will enable you to take steps toward its accomplishments, he wrote in the letter. 
And Bessie's Arboretum was actually planted in the early 1900s. And um, the curved sidewalks you can see on this plan. This is Bessie's Arboretum down here. And you can see where the plantings um, were installed along with the sidewalks. Um, a few of these, tree, very few of these trees remain today from his arboretum. In the building of what is now Hardin Hall, this super, superb collection of trees on East Campus was lost to bulldozers during the construction of the Continuing Education Center. Trees were marked to be saved and it was misinterpreted by the contractor to be removed. So all the trees that were marked, they removed. So the wrong trees were taken out. This is a documentation that talks about the first trees that were planted on East Campus. It occurred on April 22, 1909. This list is 17 pin oak trees that were planted on the mall in observance of Arbor Day. Memorial trees were planted for significant university and the city officials, including J. Sterling Morton, the father of Arbor Day, Governor Schellenberger, and Chancellor Avery. None of these original trees remain today, but we have new oak trees planted along the mall, so trees do line that mall today. William H. Dunman influenced the landscape of campus. This is a postcard of Mr. Dunman's work on the mall on East Campus. In 1909, Regent Copeland traveled to Colorado Springs and was visiting the soldier's home and saw the landscape there and thought of all the possibilities that could happen on the campus landscape. He convinced Mr. Dunman, who was working there, to come to Nebraska. Dunman was a native of England, and he was a gardener at the Sandringham Palace, one of the king's palaces. He struggled working with Nebraska soils and the irregular setting and design of the buildings that managed, but he managed to make one of the most beautiful campuses for its size, according to Charles Bessie in 1911. And in 1911, Mr. Dunman had six men working with him. Mr. Dunman was the landscape gardener from 1909 until his death in 1946. He worked on both campuses and established many trees, shrubs, and floral plantings. His work was at its best around um, 1930 before the drought and the depression hit. In 1931, Mr. Dunman was on city campus, and he was, uh, it was documented in the paper that he was planting around new buildings and projects. So he seeded Memorial Mall, and he planted around the Social Sciences Hall, which is Pound Hall, and Teachers College, which is now Canfield North. Trees that were planted included Schweidler maples, Norway maples, cutleaf weeping birch, and two varieties of flowering crab trees. Other trees planted included pin oaks, sycamore, lindens, and Chinese elms. This is um, another piece of Dunman's work. This is a postcard view of the entrance from 35th Street. Ag Hall is in the background. So this shows the ornamental plantings that he used um, right at the entrance to East Campus. This is dated from 1920, or in the 20s. S.W. Perrin was hired to, in 1889, to be the campus superintendent of the farm. Perrin's family lived on campus in the Perrin house. He devoted his work on the farm until his death in 1930. A half section of land known as the Experimental Farm was purchased in 1874. And that is, is basically the boundary that we have today of East Campus, from Holdridge to Huntington Layton, from 33rd to 48th Street. That's the half section. 
So, it, so on the original property was the stone house and the barn. In 1875, the parent house was built, which is the larger house. So one year after they purchased the property. The dormitory became the parent house where the family lived, as well as rooms for students. It was much like one big happy family in the house. And the students called S.W. Perrin, Dad Perrin. Here's another photo of the Perrin house. This was the hub of activity on the farm. A porch was added to the house, which Mr. Dunman built. And another photo, a closer view, and you can see the details on the porch. These details were used to construct the replica of the porch today. So on campus, built in 1993, is this porch that is a replica of the original parent, porch, parent house porch. It was built on the site where the parent house was originally built. Plantings around the house include lilac, junipers, yews, and many plants that would have been planted at that time. Tree peonies, which are planted along the south side, are really spectacular in the spring, and this is a photo of when the tree peonies are blooming. Earl Maxwell was also important for campus, and Maxwell Arboretum is named after him. He was an extension forester from 1934 to 1952. Most of the big trees that were planted by Maxwell um, when he established the area as a test plotting site called Maxwell Arboretum. The wooden gazebo on the south entrance was built in memory of Carl Larch, who's an extension forester after Maxwell. So he started in 52 and ended in 1970. And here's a photo of the oak trees that are in the middle of Maxwell Arboretum that we think that Maxwell planted. Here's uh, the cottonwood tree, thought to be also be planted by Earl Maxwell. Trees are living elements and they eventually die or a storm destroys them. So at Landscape Services, we like to propagate some of our significant trees so that these trees can live on. So we have a new cottonwood tree planted on the edge, um, on the north edge of Maxwell Arboretum, and um, it's near the prairie. It's a, from, the, from plants from the, or from cuttings of the original tree. And then I also wanted to mention about the bald cypress tree in Maxwell Arboretum. Um, it's located in the north part of the campus or I mean of the Arboretum, and it's, it is the Nebraska State Champion Bald Cypress Tree. And this tree is native to southeastern U.S. It typically grows in swampy areas, but it, it will grow here in our dry soils. The lo in the location where it's at, it's along the creek, and it start, it's starting to develop cypress knees, which is where the roots come out of the ground and grow above the ground. They're not very big. In the swamps, they're a lot bigger, but where we have them, it's very small. But you can go see them up next to the bank on the east side of this tree. Another person that influenced um, the campus was Bud Dazenbrock. He came to UNL in 1978. He also changed the campus significantly. He convinced administrators that what the campus looked like was a determining factor in why college students, which campus they chose to go to. Bud was quoted in the Daily Nebraskan in 1980 as saying that plants make a difference between a mediocre environment and one which you can be proud of. He hoped that if the campus looked good, the students would treat it with more respect and wouldn't litter or cut across the grass. He also improved the staff with training and goal setting. In 1980, 6,000 trees were planted, new trees were planted on both campuses. The emphasis was to plant on new sites and in parking lots. Native Nebraska plants were planted 
because those were the ones that were better acclimated to the harsh environment of Nebraska. But some exotic plants were also used in special locations. Bud was instrumental in designating all of both campuses as an arboretum. The UNL Botanical Garden and Arboretum, which be also became part of the Nebraska Statewide Arboretum. One element of the Botanical Garden is that we plant many different plants on campus and that we also have uh, a plant database, which we still maintain today. When Bud retired in 1997, we chose this tree, which is outside of Hamilton and Old Father Hall, to dedicate to him. And there's a plaque there next to the tree. It's the classic shape oak tree. And it was there before Hamilton and Manter Halls were built. And um, unfortunately, the trunk is also buried on this tree because you can see that it doesn't have a flare at the bottom. It just goes straight into the ground. Typically, you have a flare at the bottom. This tree is on the 1929 tree survey, so we know it's really old. Um, and again, we propagated from this tree, and we have a new bur oak tree planted nearby, closer to the woods building. Now we're going to talk about the gardens. We'll start with city campus gardens. We have about 14 named gardens on city and east campus. The ones I'm going to talk about today our Love Garden, which is south of Love Library, so it's just south of where we are today. Cather Garden, which is um, on the west side of the Love Library north. Donaldson Garden, Meyer Commons, and then Enright Garden. And one thing that we need to think about is that these roads used to all go through campus. So 14th Street went through campus, 12th Street went through campus, S Street, and T Street. So first is Love Gardens. This was a photo taken around 1950. Um, 10 years before this, 1940, Professor James Sellers protested that the downtown campus was the barren desert-like open spaces which was very different from the Ag Campus, which had trees and mowed green spaces. He questioned how a university with a College of Agriculture and a Department of Horticulture justify this lack of planting. Within a few months, the Lincoln Alumni Club began planting the landscape grounds around the new library. Donald L. Love, a banker in 1940, he left his estate of $800,000 to build Love Library. And then, in, uh, during the 40s, with the support of the Cooper Foundation, the floral displays at the south side of Love Library were developed. The gardens were planted in a formal design with privet hedges, junipers, and roses. And these gardens later were changed to be perennial gardens, which is what we have today, so that they would have interest, all around interest during the summer as well as even in the winter. The bed positioning is still the same where we have four beds that line the walks, uh, four up on the close to the building and then four down closer to the R Street and the turf grass is all around it. Here's an early photo of workers doing handwork, probably preparing this area for seating in the front of Love Library, and those are the beds beyond. This is the green space north of Love Library. Andrews Hall is in the background, right here is Andrews. This is where Catherine Donaldson Gardens are located today as well as the library. There were temporary buildings plant, or built here for the troops in around the 40s. This, this is where you see S Street and T Street still going through campus. And then the parking on the side of the street. Here's another view of that area. So again, we have Love Library in the middle with Cupolo. And then um, 
which is what is called Pound Hall now, which used to be the CBA, College of Business Administration in the foreground. And this is the area north of there, which we have is a is garden area. And we can see all of these parking lots. So they took out the temporary buildings and they put in the parking lots. So um, there's a lot of traffic right in the center of campus because of these parking lots. So here's a view of 12th and R Street in 1946. Pedestrian conflict. <laughs> we think we have issues today with bicycles and pedestrians, but there were issues with cars and pedestrians. Today, 12th Street is closed. This, so this area is closed off to traffic. This area is all the lead plaza. And then um, R Street turns into 12th Street at this intersection. Here's a photo from the late 1960s. This was taken from Love Library. You can see Burnett Hall in the background. This is Burnett and newly built Old Father and Hamilton Hall. And the old museum right here, which was built by Thomas, or which was designed by Thomas Kimball, unfortunately was torn down in 1970. That sits, was sitting on where Sheldon parking lot is today. And then you can also see Ferguson Hall back here behind there. An article in the Daily Nebraskan talked about how the crews were having a difficult time keeping up with the current building and construction changes. There had been no new landscape projects for the past 10 years, so from 65 to around 1975, and that the crews were trying to catch up. The current staff in 1975 was about 30 or 40, with a few of them being students. The grounds department was attempting to upgrade the campus by planting trees and shrubs to improve the landscape as much as possible. Also was noted in the article was that there was another area of landscape improvement that was done by planting two large evergreen trees in the parking lot west of the student union. The main purpose of these trees was to eliminate the traffic problem in the lot. The location of the trees made it necessary for cars to park in proper stalls. I was trying to figure that out. So west of the Union, there is a parking lot. And there's one big evergreen tree in it. And we planted that that tree was in it. And there was a matching one on the other end of the, of the 14th Street Mall. So I went to our plant database and I looked up that tree. And it was planted in 1976. So that is probably the tree that they were talking about here. It's a Chinese pine. It's a very low growing tree. You have to notice it. It's very nice. Um, this is S Street. So the Union, this drop off right here is to the Union, in the north side of the Union. And um, the parking lot over here, this is Selleck, and this parking lot um, was. Uh, the one that turned into a, a green space later on. Here's another view of that same parking lot we were just looking at, but now S Street is closed. So S Street, which went through here, is now the Union Plaza. And it also has the original Broyhill Fountain in it. This parking lot and the one further north to it were the two last remaining parking lots in the center core of campus. And then here is a view of the after that parking lot was removed around 1995. And this parking lot became green space. Chancellor Spanier worked with the students to get them to agree to remove this parking lot and create an open green space that could be used for student events. The far parking lot was removed when the Kaufman Center was built. Um, these were the last two remaining parking lots in the center of campus. And I mentioned earlier that this parking lot um, was the one that was 
kind of moved to Memorial Mall at the time when um, this one went out, they added the parking as a temporary lot. So Enright Garden, this is Dorothy Enright. She lives in Houston and she's 97 years old and still going. She is the wife of Lee Enright, a landscape architect who conceived the project of the Cather Enright and Donaldson Gardens around Love North while working, and Enright was working on the master plan for the campus at the time. Enright Garden is located where Mueller Tower is, and it's between Burnett and Andrews Hall, and between Morrill and Bessie Hall. Mrs. Enright dedicated Enright Gardens in October 1976 for her late husband, and she said that he would be honored to have this garden named for him. Catherine Donaldson Gardens were also dedicated at that same time. This is the master plan that Lee Enright helped with. He was a landscape architect that worked for Caudill, Rollett, and Scott in Houston, Texas. And he worked very closely with uni the university on this master plan for the firm. Um, the central campus core area had the gardens around the library were a focal point of the campus and they were designed to be an asymmetrical pattern to, in, to counterbalance the symmetry of the grid pattern of the surrounding buildings. Berms were added to make the design a pleasing effect. Mr. Enright translated Carl Donaldson's vision for a beautiful campus into reality. This was the last project that Mr. Enright worked on and one that he took a deep personal as well as professional interest in. Lee Enright and his wife Dorothy's only connection to the University of Nebraska was through his professional projects. Um, and Sheldon was built in 1961 and dedicated in 63. Philip Johnson was the architect. But the sculpture garden was dedicated in 1970. And this was also designed by Caudill, Rollett, and Scott of Houston, Texas, with Mr. Enright contributing to the design of this garden as well. Enright Garden, as I mentioned, is located between Morrill Hall and Bessie, as you can see here, with Love Library in the background. And here's a photo of it with the um, the base at, at the Enright Garden at the base of the tower. Another view of Enright Garden in the background with um, graduation happening and the students walking towards the Coliseum where the graduation ceremony was held. In the background is Mueller Tower and Love Library again and Enright Garden with the crisscrossing walks. And here's a current view of Cather Garden Cather Garden is located between Pound Hall and Burnett Hall. So Pound Hall is here. And um, this is Love Library, North Edition. Cather Garden was conceived in the centennial year of Cather's birth, so 1973, and was dedicated with the Enright and Donaldson Gardens in 1976. A donation in memory of Johanna Albans and a grant from the Lincoln Garden Club also helped fund the planting for this garden. Prior to it being used as a garden, it was a parking lot. Cather Garden was planted primarily with Nebraska native plants. When we were working recently on the berm, this berm we've recently reworked, we even chose some plants that were native to Webster County, which is where Cather was from. This is a view of Cather Garden soon after it was planted in 1976. Look at this nice truck, huh? So this is Donaldson Garden and Myers Common. Donaldson Garden is this area. Um, so this is Teachers College which is now Canfield North. It was named after Carl Donaldson, and he was the university business manager emeritus. 
who, and he's the one who had the vision for these gardens when they worked on the master plan. And Donaldson Garden is planted with introduced plants. I mentioned Cather was native, Donaldson is introduced. Myers Column, Myers Commons, which is this area, was developed 20 years after Donaldson Garden. Earlier, I showed a photo of this site as a parking lot. The site is bounded by Kaufman, Selleck, Union, the Union Plaza, and um, the Donaldson Garden. It was renamed and dedicated in July of 2008 as Meyer Commons. It was made possible with private support from Donald and Lorena Meyer of Illinois. Over the years, their family also provided numerous student scholarship and fellowships to benefit students in various academic areas. Donald Meyer was from Oshkosh, Nebraska, and he graduated from the university in 1941 in business administration and broadcasting. He worked during school and had to take a year off to work to get through school. So he wanted, so he also provided support for scholarships for other students. And he also wanted to associate his name with a space on campus that was very active and used by many students. After school, he worked for NBC, and then he branched out on his own and produced many popular television shows, including Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom and Zoo Parade. This is called University Plaza. It's a garden that was designed and constructed in 2011 at the location of the first campus building, University Hall. The space was made available when Ferguson Hall was raised. The Cornelian granite stones that, that the people are sitting on came from the same quarry as the stones in the Union Fountain. Um, and these came from Millbank, South Dakota. The plaque on the vertical granite slab was on the south wall of Ferguson Hall and we moved it to this location when Ferguson was removed. This plaque commemorates University Hall, which was built in 1869 and, and raised in 1948. The people on the plaque on one side are dressed like 1869 on the left side, and on the right side, they're dressed like 1948. You'll have to go look at it. It's, it's a nice plaque. So the East Campus Gardens, primarily we have Maxwell Arboretum, which encompasses a large area along the frontage, and then Yider and Fleming in this area. Maxwell Arboretum was named after Earl Maxwell and was dedicated in 1969, and the trees in the background is Maxwell Arboretum. Maxwell Arboretum is the flagship arboretum for the Nebraska Statewide Arboretum, which was established in 1978. And then Yider Garden in the foreground is a large perennial display bed located just east of the dairy store on East Campus. Clayton Yider dedicated this garden to his late wife. Clayton was a uh, was an Nebraska alum and also the sec a Secretary of Agriculture. So there's a statue of him located near the garden. Fleming Slope is the garden that's created on the bank when um, the dairy store was created. The building in the background had a higher elevation than the grade next to it. So there's a, sl uh, there's a bank there, a slope. So, this was um, dedicated to the Fleming brothers in 1994 to honor them. The brothers are in the front of this photo. The Lincoln Garden Club provided funding for the garden to honor James, Robert, and David Fleming, who were Lincoln's premier hybridizers of hardy hibiscus, or hardy perennials from the 40s till the 1990s. They were known for developing hibiscus, dianthus, and chrysanthemums, as well as many other perennials. I'm going to talk a few, about a few significant trees on campus. This is the 1929 survey that I referred to before. All of the dots on this plan are trees that were um, documented um, by Walter Blankman. 
It's from 1929, and um, the list of trees, there's 30 different, or 39 different trees. Um, and we still have some of these trees today. This tree right here is a, oh, my thing's not, yeah, it's not monitoring, but. Anyway, so there's a catalpa, there's a pine, we'll go through them. So there's an English oak that's over by Westbrook. And that tree, again, doesn't have a trunk flare, so we think that it was buried and was there before Westbrook was built. The Austrian pine that's over by Woods Hall um, was on that survey, documented to be there. And this would have been in front of University Hall at the time. The Cather tree um, <coughs> Was, this tree was, is an Austrian pine that was dedicated to Willa Cather, who was from the class of 1895. And um, we can see, this, this one's also on the 1929 survey, but it also shows up in this picture, where um, this double trunk is a, still the same tree that we see there today. Um, this is a view of University Hall on a graduation day. The Schiller linden tree um, is, is a new tree. Lawrence Fossler was a professor of German language at the University of Nebraska from 1889 to 1926. He was born in Germany and immigrated to the U.S. in 1872 at the age of 15. Fossler dedicated the tree to Schiller, and the plaque is written in German, and it says, The Great Poet and Thinker. It was dedicated on May 9, 1905. The tree became very large, and, and there's, this fence was all on all four sides of the tree, and the tree was starting to grow into the fence. So we reconfigured the fence using all the parts and left it so that it was more open for the tree. Well, then a storm came and took the tree out. So um, after the tree... Um, the first tree, we, it took us a while because it's an American linden and those are, trees are kind of hard to find. We found one, we planted it, and the first football Saturday, it was damaged and snapped off. So we found another one, and that one was also vandalized. But so, so this is the third linden tree that we've planted in this area. And that one's doing well. Here's the catalpa tree that's on the south side of Architecture Hall. The, the large tree is in poor health, so we again propagated it and make another, made another small tree. So this is our new catalpa tree. This is the original in the catalpa tree. And the Newton apple tree. This tree was produced from grafting a twig from Sir Isaac Newton's original tree in England that helped Newton discover the law of gravitation. The tree grew in the nursery on East Campus until it was large enough to be moved onto campus, and it was dedicated in 1991. This is a Flower of Kent apple tree, and the plaque on it identifies it, and it's located south of the Bainland and Brace Halls. When the physics department was planning to move to Jorgensen Hall, I sat in on a few of those meetings, and they said in the meeting, well, we want to take our tree with us. <laughs> and I said, well, that's not possible. It's too big. So again, we propagated this tree, and we made two little trees for them. And in May of 2015, we dedicated these two trees and we planted them near Jorgensen Hall. We had a, it was a Arbor Day ceremony with the Jorgensen Hall physics students. And they came out and helped us plant the trees and were so excited about these trees. They even helped us, they of course helped us plant them but then they helped us water and even mulch them. Usually that part, everyone leaves before you get that part. But they helped do that too. 
So 150 years from the raw prairie to a well-designed and maintained campus landscape. From the very beginning, chancellors, the Board of Regents, faculty and staff knew that a beautiful campus full of trees and flowers was a great recruitment tool. Landscape Services is proud of the beautiful campus we maintain and is honored to be a part of this 150th year of tradition and growing a campus. We have celebrated the 150th anniversary by putting four displays of flowers um, on campus. These, this one is the pansy flower display that um, was recently removed and now we've put in begonias in this area on city campus and on east in front of the dairy store we have the same plantings. So I'm also planning to do some campus walking tours if you're interested. One of city and east campus. I've set the dates, uh, there's sign up sheets in the back of the room. If um, the tour, um, we're gonna try and limit the size of the tour and if the tour doesn't fit your schedule or it becomes full, I have a waiting list up there too so we can maybe do another walking tour if, you, uh, if there's interest. So I'm ready for questions. <laughs> So thank you, Eileen, for that fascinating uh, visual history of the campus landscapes through time. Um, we really appreciate it. So as Dr. Wilhelm said earlier, my name is Nathan Meyer. It's my pleasure to moderate the question and answer session this afternoon. Um, hopefully Eileen's piqued your interest and curiosity and you're ready to pepper her with a few questions. If you do have a question, please raise your hand and Jeff will run the microphone over to you. This is critical for the folks who are joining on the web stream or watching on Facebook Live. So are there any questions for Eileen? I'm interested in uh, what you have found works best regarding native plants and over the period of time that you have shown us, has there been a shift in what native plants are working better? So has climate in effect hit Nebraska? Can, can we begin to plant different, in quotes, native trees and shrubs? Thank you. Yes. Well. Um, over the years, we've always used, you know, Bud wanted to use native plants and we continue to use native plants. Um, and they work, you know, well on campus. Um, sometimes we have some issues with native plants in that they like to seed um, readily. So they become also a maintenance issue. So we balance that with, you know, the native plants that don't do that or using them, um, having them out there too, just for display, but not having as many of that. But yes, we do use lots of native plants. And over the years, they've done well too, as well as some introduced plants. This is more a comment, but um, you mentioned people not helping with maintenance chores so much. But I've, I've seen pictures of a tradition back about 1900, 1910 or so of Dandelion Day. Yeah. And pictures of people, you know, women, students, faculty out digging dandelions in the grassy areas to help maintain the campus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I, I saw that photo and I failed to get a copy of it in here because it's a very good one. Um, but I would say at that time, that was all handwork. And today we, we uh, take care of the dandelions by using chemicals. So we don't need to do that. Good yeah. That's the difference between, I mean, that, the one picture I showed of um, like six guys out hand raking and uh, a big, large area probably preparing it for seeding. Um, today we wouldn't use, you know, six people all doing the same thing. We would use a machine and some handwork in trying to get it done. That's how we can still um, accomplish a lot of, of tasks and take care of this many acres of campus with the limited amount of staff that we have. 
Other questions? I uh, live two blocks from where we are right now. Yeah. And I call the campus my private walking park. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed that the squirrels and the birds just totally ignore me. They're not afraid at all. What, what have you done to make them so comfortable with, with people? Well, <laughs> I can tell you one thing that has happened is there is a gentleman that comes to campus and he feeds them every day. He feeds the squirrels and he feeds um, the birds too. So primarily the squirrels have become very friendly because they expect maybe you to feed them. <laughs> so yeah, that's not really good to do, but. Um, what side was the yeah, Newton apple tree and do you know if it's had apples yet? Oh yes. The, oh, the little ones? The little trees? No. The little trees have not developed apples yet. And it is over by Jorgensen Hall, and it's on the uh, west side of the building, sort of in their courtyard area. Um, but the other apple tree has apples, and you can get, take them from the ground. We don't want you to pick them off the tree. But um, they're very sour, sour and they... Um, don't ripen very well, so. But they're fun to eat, because it's Newton. <laughs> Hi, Eileen. Um, Hi, thanks. My question is, you had mentioned Bud um, thought that campus and the beautification of a campus would work as a recruitment tool. I wondered if that is still the values and if that's reflected in budgets and projects on campus, um, make, making campus part of the um, the beauty of campus part of the draw to the university? Um, I believe that it is still the philosophy. Um, we have heard from many administrators that, um, and have seen support for our department and to make sure that we um, keep the staff that we need and that we upgrade the campus when we can. And we are upgrading it with trees and site accessories and you know, certain areas making improvements as we go. So I do think that they think, still think it is very valid. Is there any consideration given to the plantings in terms of using them as teaching tools for different classes? Yes, there is. So uh, especially on East Campus, um, be, because the horticulture faculty use the campus as their learning laboratory. There are um, a few gardens that they use primarily, and then we also make sure that we coordinate with them to, to uh, have the plants that they need for design. But we also hear that other people use the campus in many different ways. So, yes, it is used. Eileen, maybe you could talk just for a minute about the UNL Garden Friends. Oh. I should have you do that. A little plug. <laughs> the UNL Garden Friends is a group that was started when Bud um, designated the um, both city and east campus as a botanical garden. And so this was an advisory group or a board that um, was meant to support the gardens. And so we still have the UNL Garden Friends today as a group that gets together. Um, they help us fund projects on campus. They help um, support our department. Um, they do many things for us. And it's a membership-based group. Um, did I miss anything? Good. Yeah, we're taking new membership, yes. Um, one of their first projects was the gates at Love Library. So the perennial beds that we talked about, you can walk through gates into Love Library garden area. And that was one of their first projects. They've also done, um, helped us recently with Nisei Plaza. We re recently restored that whole area and redeveloped that, um, which is up by Kimball. It's a Japanese 
uh, second generation Nisei garden. And um, they've also helped with Morrill Hall, they've helped in Ag Hall on East Campus, so several projects that have helped us, as well as helping our staff um, fund um, cookouts, a cookout to thank the students for helping us work with us in the summer, for example. Um, I teach in the School of Art, and um, I, I recently visited uh, Stanford University um, just a, about two weeks ago, and they have this beautiful new building that has um, a lot of, it, there are these kind of lounge spaces on top, um, really accessible to students, and then a number of uh, trees and other plants up there. And I, I didn't know if we have any buildings like that on campus that have kind of rooftop, I don't know if there'd be gardens or something like that, or if there were any plans for anything like that. And if so, would that be something that you would maintain or give any idea? Hmm. I, I don't think we have any gar any buildings like that. We um, when you talk about rooftop, um, we have started to try and do um, some green roofs, and there's one of those over at Whittier that is actually accessible in one of the courtyards. So usually green roofs are on the top and you can't get to them. Oh, there's also one at, um, at um, the rec center on East that Richard Sutton worked on. So um, those are sometimes garden areas that people can get to, but we don't, um, I don't think have one what you're specifically describing. And I'm not sure if there's one like that in the works. Could you tell us a little bit about the current uh, landscape master plan, maybe some of the highlights looking to the future, and also um, who is overseeing that plan, who developed that plan? Um, I'm not the best person to answer that question. So the, la the most recent master plan is five years ago. Can you help me, Emily? 2013. 13, okay. Yes. And um, I can't really answer all of the, Emily Casper would be able to answer that better than me. Yeah, so. We still, uh, we do, um, we have technology projects, and we do as we look through um, landscape topics that as we reach out. Oh, take the mic, mic. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, yes. Um, we do follow the landscape master plan in conjunction with the development master plan. Um, uh, when we have capital improvement projects, um, that is our guiding principle document that we work with. Um, it's a guideline, so um, they rely on, um, uh, on myself to kind of give some information and inform kind of what we can do, and then I work with um, others in landscape services to discuss how we're going to maintain those. Um, Love Commons, the um, north side of that, is um, a product of that part of that landscape master plan. Um, the, the big key part of that was how do we integrate exterior and interior spaces and improve our civic infrastructure. As Eileen mentioned, um, there was a, a very strong uh, uh, perspective about how the landscape was important to um, recruitment, and um, that is a part of that resurgence in that landscape master plan. So um, it is definitely our guiding document right now. So great, Thank you. great dialogue, great conversation. We don't want to stand between you and Dairy Store ice cream, so I encourage you to continue the discussion during the reception. Thank you. Thank you.